you don't want, but... Father, we sure thank you for your many blessings and how uh, good you have been to us. Uh, thank you, Lord, for all the things that are going on across the entire nation and the world while everyone seems to be in upheaval and chaos and concern and worry. It sure is good to know that we know who holds tomorrow and we know who our future is in. And, uh, Lord, we realize that uh, life could be short and be ending in a very short period of time, but we recognize we'll be in eternity with you in heaven. We sure appreciate that consolation and knowing that, that even if it did get bad, that we know that it's going to get better for us eventually. Would you please uh, bless this day? Please come by, visit with us, spend some time with us, and uh, teach us and instruct us, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, now some of the things that I've been talking to you about here has to do with the book of Ephesians. I probably will be uh, January before I start Daniel, but once we start into Daniel, we're going to probably be there for an extended period of time. That's not, uh, you, can't, you can't go through that book uh, without, um, after you get past the first three chapters or so, after that it starts running pretty deep and you, you've got to cover uh, almost every single verse. And it ties in with uh, Revelation and ties in with Genesis and a multitude of other places. And a lot of it is current prophetic events that are going to happen eventually. Some of it is historical, but in order for you to get it and put it in the proper perspective, there's no way to do it except just tediously picking the verses apart a little bit of time, you know, a little bit at a time, like getting the, you know, the chicken or the turkey off the bone when you get finished eating. So I want to finish this thing with uh, standing because he recognizes in the last days, the Bible says that there'll be many will give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, and many will depart from the faith. And then he tells you in another place over there that a time will come when they won't endure sound doctrine, but heap to themselves teachers having itching ears after their own lusts, and then uh, being turned away from the truth and unto fables. So you're living in a day and time where you're going to notice or recognize if you're smart about it, that that can apply to you if you're not careful. Don't ever put yourself in a position as a Bible believer that just because you know the Bible that you can't be given the heed to seducing spirits and that you can't be turned away from the truth and be turned unto fables. Uh, a preacher said one time, he said, you know, uh, all good doctrine is not good preaching. And when we're talking about from an entertainment standpoint, that may be true, but the best preaching is doctrinal in foundation. And the reason is, is it sets a parameter. It sets a, 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 a distance or it should put a distance between you and being drawn away. Now, the reason that I try to teach you this stuff is, is to prepare you not because I'm accusing you that this is happening to you, but to make you aware that it can happen to you if you're not cautious. You have to pay attention to what it is that you're doing. And from a biblical perspective, he's writing that to save people. In Galatians chapter number six over there, or Galatians chapter five there, he said, who did hinder you? Meaning from running the race, from doing what God would have you to do. Along the way, the devil has recognized, he understands eternal security better than uh, most of us do, and he believes it more than most of us do. He knows he can't take your soul. So all he wants to do now is, is he wants to take away your rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. And if he can take your testimony, he'll take it in a heartbeat. He would rather ruin a Christian's testimony than he would to take an unsaved person to hell. He can do a lot more damage by ruining your testimony than he can do with damage for a lost person. People get the mistaken idea that the devil's hanging out in the honky talks and the bars and in the bad places and so on and so forth. The devil's in the church. He's not worried about them. They're already coming to see him. What he wants to do is mess you up. Now, the Bible says in Ephesians 6, the passage where we're at now, he said, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, power, spiritual wickedness, rulers of darkness, and high places. In Ephesians chapter number 4, he warns you and he tells you uh, that you don't let the sun go down upon your wrath because we're not ignorant of the devil's devices. And then he tells you again in 2 Corinthians in chapter number 2 there, when he comes down that passage about forgiveness and the unforgiving, he said to forgive one another. And the reason you forgive one another, but you're not ignorant of the devil's devices. The devil is your enemy. I know you think it's people and I know you think it's compromise. I know you think it's all the things. It's the devil using whatever he can use to mess up your testimony to get you out of fellowship with the Lord. I've used this before, but it's, a, it's just a good illustration uh, about the vacuum cleaner, but plugged in the vacuum cleaner in. And I used the illustration not long ago because it was brought to my attention. I thought we were doing good because, listen, it's much more convenient to use a lithium battery powdered uh, thing, and it's a lot lighter, and it's easier mobility and stuff like that. And it, and it makes the little 
uh, marks in the rug, so it looks like you vacuumed it. But what I didn't realize is it doesn't have the suction power as one that plugs in, and so actually the dirt is just underneath the bottom. It ain't pulling it out. And so then the next thing you know, you get the little clear thing, and it shows a bunch of fur balls in there, or fuzz balls. At least we have that at our house. You may not have it yours. You probably eat off your floors. But our house, we actually get a little dirty in there every now and then. And you got this little thing. You think, oh, well, I've really cleaned the floor. And then you go get a regular vacuum cleaner and you plug it in the wall and the bag is slammed full of stuff. I mean, I even got somebody gave us one of these little things that are they're round and they run around on a computer. Um, not a dog. It ba yeah, that whatever that is, a robo thing. And it goes around and bumps into this and that and the other. And you're thinking, that's pretty good, man. You don't even have to push the vacuum cleaner around. Well, I hate to tell you those that little tiny beater bar. I mean, it makes marks on the floor and stuff like that, but it doesn't pick up the trash. Come on. What I needed is high-powered suction. You say, what is it? It's more inconvenient. It's heavier. It's not as it's more cumbersome. It's more difficult to use. And it makes it difficult because the second that you get just a little ways from the wall, the stinking plug comes out of the wall. And you have to get the plug, and then you have to go put it in another place. It requires more effort, but it keeps the rugs clean. And what I've realized in my relationship with the Lord is, is that when things, a lithium battery can't replace the plug-in. And there's all of those little silly nuances that take place and you're thinking, oh, well, it's okay. No, you just get in the surface of the problem. As a man thinketh in his what? Heart. So is he. Out of the abundance of the heart. the mouth speaketh. So I've got to be a caution where I've got to, I got to get down deep to get that dirt. I'm pretty good on the outside. Um, you give me, a, give me a, a, a washcloth and a little bar of soap, I can clean up okay on the outside. But that doesn't take care of the stuff on the inside. What does it mean? It means I've got to stay close to the plug. Now, if you don't do that, the next thing you know, you'll spend all your time watching everything and everybody else. One of the greatest indicators that your plug's out of the wall is, is you're more worried about what everybody else is doing than what you and, your and the Lord are doing. Your plug's out of the wall. And you know what you need to do? You need to move back closer to the wall. So while I already got that, you need to get plugged back in. And so if you'll learn that, and that's why I'm trying to give you the warning. The warning is to Christians. And the warning is to preachers. And the warning is to pastors. And the warning is to Sunday school teachers. And the warning is to people that are coming to church. Every, like you. You come to Sunday school. You come Sunday morning. You come Sunday night. You come Wednesday night. You come to special meetings and stuff. The warning's to you. Because what can happen is you get to running off that battery power juice. You think, I'm doing pretty good. I'm still moving around. Next thing you know, you're wondering, what's the problem? And then so-and-so said, and so-and-so did, and such and such happened. The next thing you know, I'm done. I'm through. I'm out. I quit. I give up. Me and the Lord are just not close like we used to be. I don't know what in the world's going on. Your plug's out of the wall. So the stuff I'm giving you here is not to be taken in the sense of I'm getting on to you. Uh, people are real sensitive about that stuff nowadays. I'm not getting on to you. I'm giving you a warning. I told you about the fellow that was ready to drive off the bridge and I was ready to do that. And he got upset at my tone of the, my voice because I'm trying to keep him from driving off the bridge. I'm just trying to keep you from driving off the bridge and breaking your fool neck spiritually. You, 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 I don't know. I, don't, I think some of you think I must have like a list of names up here and I'm checking it twice and finding out who's not here nice or something. And it's like, well, why, why do you have to say that to me? I'm not, how do you, why, why would you think I'm saying it to you? Why do you think the Lord's saying that to you? <laughs> so when I give you these things, it's a, it's a checklist. It's just to find out how you're doing. There's nothing wrong with that. That's a good time to be selfish. How's your relationship with the Lord? Not how's everybody else's relationship with the Lord. And so when he comes down here and gives you that and he gives you those instructions, he tells you there's certain things that you ought to be doing. Now, the thing that we left off was about the Word of God. That has to do with uh, don't give up what you read and what you hold on to. That's the Bible. Now, you're back in a resurgence. Come again over to Hebrews 4. You'll know this passage already. We covered these the other day. I'm going through them again real quick. There's a resurgence now of uh, doubting the, the Bible as your authority. The problem is not about scholastics. It's not about education. It's not about scholarship. The problem, ladies and gentlemen, is authority. 
The problem is and has always been, even with the scholars, it has nothing to do whatsoever with, uh, with the scholarship or with them being able to say Alpha and Delta, the Greek manuscript, said this. And in the Hebrew Masoretic text it says this. And the trilateral root word of that in the anti-P note is placed here in order for it to be able to say that. And to change the tense of the verb of that thing and change it from a noun to a verb. Because we know that in Hebrew and Greek and all that, now most of you probably didn't understand anything I said. That's a little bit that I remember from school when I was in there. You say, what did it do? Uh, makes you think I know something I don't know anything about. I just used a bunch of nomenclature, just like I could wind up using a lot of medical terms, make you think I was a doctor just because I used some. Doesn't mean you know anything, you just know the terms. What the issue with those individuals is, is they don't like to be told what to do. The issue is authority. It always has been authority. Yea, hath God said. That started in Genesis 3, and it'll run all the way through, out past the tribulation, in through the millennium, and it will not be forever settled in heaven until after the great white throne judgment. And then after that, it'll be the accepted authority across the board. Our problem is authority. Now what they do is they cover it up and they make it look nice by making you think, I, I'm, I have to be very smart. Uh, my pastor uh, has a PhD in Greek and, and, and uh, manuscript evidence and he happens to know this and that and the other. Anybody that changes it, I don't care how many letters are behind their name, anybody that changes what God said is demonic. Amen. You have to recognize that. I'm just calling it like it is. Amen. That's the absolute authority. Well, I don't understand it. You know what? If you could understand it, it would mean you were as smart as the guy that wrote it. Amen. I like I don't understand it. I understand enough of it to be afraid of it. And I get comfort out of it. I'll show you that in a little while. But ladies and gentlemen, the whoever wrote that book is smarter than I am. I'm not getting up there and saying, well, didn't you really mean to say this? Hey boys, let me ask you a question in your, in your uh, relationship there with your wife. How's that work out with you when all of a sudden she says one thing and you say, honey, didn't you really mean to say... And she said, no, I said what I meant to say. And now all of a sudden you're in an argument over what a word means. That sounds like people arguing over what the book says. Don't worry about the things you don't know or understand in the book. Worry about the things you understand in the book. That's the way that you get more wisdom on it. You know, the great thing about this book is, is that the more you read it, the less you know. Really, the more you read it, the more you think, I, I got it now. I got it. I got it. I, I, I got it, boy. And you read through the thing and you're like, where did that come from? It's always been there, but how, how, what is it that kept you from seeing it? And then all of a sudden the Lord turns a light on and you see it. How did you not see it the first time? That book is a spiritual book, but that book has to do with authority. And if you come to that book and won't submit yourself to the authority, the Lord cuts off your revelation of it. You'll have a certain amount educationally that you'll know and you'll always know. But the Lord Paul says this in, uh, in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. He says they proceed no further. The Lord turns off the light, wants you to say, I don't know, is that what God really said? You know when God's speaking to you. Can I say this to you? Every time God speaks to you, it's not always a rebuke. But if you want to make the Bible to make sense, you have to realize that the Bible teaches you here in Hebrews chapter number 4, that book first and foremost is a critical book. It's not made, ladies and gentlemen, to go along with human nature. You have to recognize, and I'll give you this in the message this morning, but when you go out, you go out according to the Bible, you go out east to west if you're going in the right direction. You say, why? That's the direction that the sun goes. You know how the world turns? Unless you're a flat earther, I don't, it don't turn anywhere, it just hangs. <laughs> but, it, but, you know, that, never mind. <laughs> that's, that's just something, somebody that doesn't know anything trying to look like they know something, and there's not enough information for you to be able to refute their argument, and so now they all of a sudden think, because you can't refute their argument, I got the Bible, he sits on the circle of the earth, we're done. Well, it's a plate, okay, we're done, you win. See you later. Have a nice day. Really encouraged me, helped me out in my everyday life. That Bible is, teaches about it being a sphere or a circle. Now here's the thing that you want to grab a hold of is the world turns from west to east. The sun turns from east to west. The world is contrary. You're messing with a type. He killed Moses for that. Better be careful there, flat earther. You're messing with a type. That world turns opposite of the sun. 
That's why when you start looking in the Bible, you'll find out that everybody that is successful, they go out from east to west. The Magi, the three kings from Orient are smoking a rubber cigar, that kind of thing. Those, those three kings that are coming out there, the three Magi, they're called wise men. That's what they're called. They come from the east. They're going west. Every time you see a negative connotation, you find out they're going from west to east. That's why you want to be careful about the stuff coming from the west coast coming to the east coast. A lot of the modern charismatic, schismatic stuff that's coming from the west and movement moving this direction. You say, what is it? It's, it's running the way of the world. You have to let it run the opposite of the world. Now, some of you have a hard time with that. Christianity is supposed to be opposite of the world. If you're going to rightly divide the Bible, you have to recognize that you're not going to get along with everybody. Jesus Christ was hung on a cross, but it wasn't for being anti-governmental. It was beginning against the religious system of that day. It was his own people that hung him up there. It was not an anti-governmental slant that he went into, and he came against the government. A fellow comes up to him and says, Hey, you see that coin right there? Are you, are you for Caesar or not for Caesar? He said, You got a coin on your pocket? Guy flips it to him. He picks it up, and he says, You see that right there? He said, Yeah. He said, Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar, and unto God the things that are God. Have a nice day. Pete, you know, uh, what you doing? Y'all, you your guys pay taxes? Peter, go down there on the beach. You'll find a fish down there with the coins in his mouth and get the money and pay the taxes. That the word of God be not blasphemed, sovereign citizen. That the word of God be not blasphemed. So I, Jesus paid taxes. He didn't go sign up because he was in the priesthood and, and to choose to opt out of paying taxes. That's your responsibility. Amen. You say what? That's what pays for your roads and your street lighting and for your sewer and your plumbing and for your protection and that kind of thing. Amen. Do your part. Pay your taxes. Amen. Amen. Yeah, but I'm, I'm not worried about you. You'll pay your taxes before you'll pay a tithe. I know that. Because <laughs> you're worried about them putting you in jail. You're not worried about putting the plug out of the wall. You know what I know about those three wise men? They were wise enough that when they were coming to see the king, you know what I know about them? <laughs> they were wise enough to bring something with them when they came. People get this idea that, you know, all the stuff that gets done around here, you know, well, that's just the, what, we, what we owe the people. You can't go to a movie or a restaurant and get them to give you that for free. You come to church, expect it all for free. Child care and the whole nine yards. Flushing toilets, air conditioning, Lumbar supported seats, carpet on the floor. Don't you expect it? A preacher to preach to you, people to entertain you. <laughs> if you were in business, you couldn't stay in business very long that way. See how the book criticizes you? You know what that book says? That book says you don't have to tithe. Yeah, it does. It says you just give as God's prospered you. I guess he must not have prospered some of you. I guess. I don't know. I'd have to ask Brad. He wouldn't tell me. I would probably have to pull his fingernails out to get him to tell me. <laughs> he protects y'all. But I, I, I guess as God's prospered you, I don't know. What's your breath worth? Yeah. What's your eyesight worth? Amen. I told Brother Ernie this morning. He came back and welcomed me. And preacher, good to have you. Been praying for you. And, and so on and so forth. And I said, I've learned one thing while I was gone. And he said, what's that? I said, getting old ain't for sissies. <laughs> I mean, I, good night, man. I mean, you know, the old bro, brother Tyrrell used to say, if it ain't, he said, preacher, I'm hurting here and I'm hurting there. And I said, well, that's bad. He said, no, it's good. I said, what do you mean it's good? He said, if it ain't hurting, it ain't working. <laughs> but you know what I realize? There's a lot of things I've got to be grateful for. I can still taste food. I've tasted a lot over in the last couple of weeks too, man. That's one of the greatest enjoyments in life to be able to taste food. Some of you, when the COVID thing came through, you got that. They said it tasted like cardboard or gravel or whatever. I, didn't, I, guess, I don't guess I got it. I don't know if I got it or not. I didn't have that symptom if I did get it. But I don't know what that'd be like if everything you ate tasted like cardboard. I guess it'd be a good weight loss program or something. But, man, what a drag. You can't taste food. I mean, what a drag. You got to have a, a, a be fed by a, a stomach uh, infusion and, and you don't even get to taste the food. I mean, I like the taste of coffee. Imagine it all just tastes like water. What a drag, man. 
I had a ice cream thing and they put chocolate sauce stuff on that thing and put some candied pecans and all that stuff in there. And I can distinctly pick out the flavor profile in every one of those things. <laughs> But I'm sitting there eating, man, and I got all puddled up in tears. And I thought, man, Lord, I, I sure have taken my taste buds for granted. And that old preacher telling me I have to have it real hot or real cold. And I said, why is that preacher? And he said, man, I made the biggest mistake. He said, when I was a kid before I was saved, he said, I burned out my taste buds. Ever thank God for your taste buds? I mean... Don't you have a few things to be grateful for? Yes, sir. Well, I don't want to change the message. I'm talking about being, the, the Bible being critical. The second thing you find in Hebrews 4.12 is he said, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, if you don't rightly divide the Bible, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to run into some serious problems. And not hyper divide. Somebody gave me a book by Cornelius Stam the other day. He's a hyper dispensationalist. You say, what'd you do? I thumbed it and threw it in the trash. If you read, I've read it before. I've read it all before. It's just a regurgitation of what he's been teaching a long, long time ago. He's whacked out and he's messed up because he hyper divides the Bible and he puts the divisions in the wrong places. But if you don't rightly divide the Bible, you're going to run off into trouble. Amen. For instance, in the Old Testament, this is just the usual illustration. In the Old Testament, what you find is... You find him talking about you can't eat anything that doesn't have fins and scales. Well, for us being down here in Florida, that can be a bad deal. That means you can't have catfish and you can't have shrimp and you can't have lobster. I ate a lobster while I was gone. It was a good one too, man. It was like poached and butter. Whew. Son. <laughs> I'm like, I can make a habit of this, man. But then by the time you're done, a little bit of it, that goes a long way. But man, I mean, you talk about sweet and tender and soaked in that uh, butter and things like that. Well, I'm going to hell. That's right. Leviticus 11 tells me I can't have that. If I do, God has to take me to hell for it. Dietary laws. But then I come to 1 Timothy 4. Amen. Every creature of God is, uh, to, uh, is good if it be received with prayer and thanksgiving. That's 11, 4, that's 4, 11, 12, right along in there somewhere, chapter. I can see it. It's on the left-hand side there. But at any rate, here's what he says. Now, that's a contradiction. Unless you rightly divide. I'm not a Jew in the Old Testament. I, I've gotten where now I can eat uh, bacon and ham without nitrates. I learned that from Miss Sandy. Miss Sandy warned me and warned me when we were on a canoeing trip one time and she warned me not to have the gravy and I said, it won't be enough. She said, preacher, it's got the, the, the pig in it. It's got the uh, pork in it. And I said, I ought to be fine, no problem. Man, that stuff curled my toes, man. I got sick and high fevers and all that other. We found out later it's the nitrates in it. But if it doesn't have nitrates in it, I can eat it. But because I had some bacon on one of our meals up there, bacon wrapped... Uh, <laughs> You see what I did on my vacation? <laughs> I had a bacon wrap filet. <laughs> yeah, see, yeah, see, y'all are like, mm, yeah, yeah. That was on one side of the plate. The lobster was on the other. <laughs> Hallelujah, man. And I cut into that thing and I ate that. But in the Old Testament, I'd go to hell because I ate pork. Not supposed to do that, unless I get 1 Timothy 4. Now, here's the point I'm making to you. You're not under that law anymore, but if you don't rightly divide the Bible, you can get yourself twisted up like nobody's business. You'd be like a kite out there just spinning around and spinning around and spinning around. Whenever it comes to rightly dividing the Bible, you want to make sure you understand that. And we have a lady right now that I'm trying to help out. She can't get out of her mind that Acts 2.38 in there, repent and be baptized, everyone in the name of Jesus Christ, and you shall receive the Holy Ghost. That's in the Bible. It's Acts 2.38. But at any rate, <laughs> now, now listen, Paul doesn't say anything about that at all. Here's, they're talking about rightly dividing now, right? The Apostle Paul said, I came not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. But Paul did baptize. But you see the salvation plan is different. You're not saved by baptism. We baptized Bo here a couple of weeks ago and he understood clearly his salvation had already taken place and if he'd have died, he would have gone to heaven without baptism. Water doesn't save you. It gets you wet. It's a picture, a type in this age. But it did at one time. He tells John the Baptist, he tells him that John the Baptist is having a baptism there. And he said, who told you you could repent and you better go back and bring meat fit for repentance. And when he baptized him there, it was to reveal the Messiah. 
Now they're able to see it. Baptism was connected with salvation, but not here anymore. Anymore, it's just a picture of what took place. If you don't rightly divide your Bible, you know what will happen? You'll be in the wrong church. Amen. You'll go to the wrong place and you'll go over there and you'll think sacraments save you. You'll think baptism save you. You'll think christening save you. You'll think baptism save you. You'll think some kind of work saved you. No, we're not a work, lest any man should boast. How are we saved? By grace through faith. That's in this time period. You step into the tribulation period, you're headed back under an Old Testament system and keeping the law. These are they which kept the faith in Jesus Christ and kept the commandments. You don't have to keep the commandments to be saved. I have a friend of mine right now who's in very, very poor health and stuff, and I dealt with him just a, a week or so ago on the phone for about 45 minutes to help him to understand, uh, because that since he got saved when he was a younger man, he'd done some things he shouldn't have done, and uh, explaining to him and helping him to understand, hey man, you don't have to get re-saved, you've been out of fellowship with the Lord, but if you meant business, you're saved, but you're just out of fellowship, and when he got it, he put the plug back in the wall. You could feel this big sigh of relief. I mean, he's literally on, he's got one foot in the grave and one foot on a banana peel. He'll be stepping out of here into glory before long. You know what he wanted to get settled? I got to make sure I get it right. I said, it's great that you checked up. That's what you want to do. You want to make sure. But ladies and gentlemen, if you don't get that right, you know what you're going to be? You're going to be miserable all the time because you're thinking I either I am or I am not or I'm chosen or I'm not chosen. I was foreordained before the foundation of the world. I hope he picked me. I think he picked me. I guess he picked me. Well, if he really picked me, then I'd be in church and I'd read my Bible and I'd pray. But I didn't feel like doing it. So if I didn't feel like doing it, I really didn't do it. So I must not really be because if I really was, I really would want to, but I don't really want to. And I... Man, just shoot me. You can't get any peace if you're honest. If you're honest. You can't get any peace, ladies and gentlemen, if you're relying on your righteousness to get you to heaven. There is no way you'll ever have any peace. You can't put your head on the pillow, not, not, not every night of the week, put your head on the pillow and go, Oh Lord, I know I'm good, man. If I die tonight, take my soul to heaven. Boy, I lived right today. And the Lord said, Boast not thyself of tomorrow there, big boy. Mighty proud. Amen. See, there's a lot of stuff there, the sins of the Spirit that are in there that we don't make a whole lot of big deal about, but it's there. Right. Now, when it comes to the Bible, ladies and gentlemen, you don't change what you read because you don't understand it. What it should do is it ought to move you nearly to tears, nearly to gratitude beyond words by simply recognizing that you're saved by grace through faith. It is a free gift. You are the epitome of a charity case. Amen. Amen. He gave it to you and he kept it. And then gave you your life back. That ought, you ought to just be like, I mean, why would he even do that? Why would you get to be born now? I had a discussion with a friend of mine not long ago. And he said, you ever think about what would happen if the Jews had have accepted him all the way out? They gave him another chance in Acts 7 there, 225 days after the crucifixion. He said, have you ever paused to think about if they had accepted him, where we would have been? I said, would we have been? I don't know that we would have been. Maybe. But, but where would we have been? I mean, man, if the Jew hadn't rejected, you ever think, God, they rejected? Yes, sir. They didn't get the deal you got. And nowadays, you know what's hard for them? They can't accept the free gift. They got to earn it. They can't, they can't see it. My goodness, man. I mean, you talk about you better rightly divide. If you don't, you know what will happen? You're going to drive yourself crazy. You know what you'll do? You'll go it and you'll get frustrated. You'll get out of church and everything. Go, oh, what's the use? What's the point anyway? It's not going to really matter. You know what helps in the judgment seat of Christ? If you don't judge the judgment seat of Christ, nothing mentioned about the judgment seat of Christ until Paul comes along. In the Old Testament, it's the great white throne judgment. If you don't have about the judgment seat of Christ, you know what happens? You miss half the Bible for the New Testament Christian. It's not mentioned in the Old Testament. Their judgments at the great white throne and in Revelation chapter number 11, the great white throne comes down. They receive their rewards there as well as the people that get sent off into uh, hell and then eventually the lake of fire. Yep. Amen. That's what it, where it happens. And you have to recognize that. If you don't rightly divide your Bible, you know what you do? You just make it all one thing. Yep. For years, everybody taught that for years. They didn't teach the judgment seat of Christ, even Baptist churches. They taught that the beam of seats, the same seat. When you read the passages in 1 Corinthians 3 and 2 Corinthians 5, Romans chapter 14, you read the passages that have to do with the judgment seat of Christ. They always read great white throne into all that. 
Every bit of it. That's where you get the, the false teaching in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2 where the Holy Spirit gets taken out and then the Lord's done with everything. They don't have anything to do with the Holy Spirit. They have to put some in the passage that's not there. But that's where it came from. It originated by not rightly dividing the Bible. That stuff that takes place in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, you've heard some stuff taught on here recently. That stuff that takes place there takes place after the rapture. That whole stuff right there takes place in the tribulation. It doesn't apply to you. You don't rightly divide your Bible. You know what will happen? You'll wind up being, pre, uh, you'll be, uh, wind up being mid or post-tribulation. Yes. Yep. You, you're an absolute fool to think the church is going to go through the tribulation. I didn't say you wouldn't have tribulation. Another word, trouble. But you're not going to be in the tribulation. You say, why? The Lord promised you to get you out. So many people trying so hard to put you in the tribulation. Why don't you just accept the fact God's going to haul you out of here? Amen. I mean, I hope he does. I don't know how bad it's going to get. I know this. The devil's not going to be on the throne. I'm not going to take the mark of the beast. I don't have to worry about all that stuff. But they're trying so hard to shove you into that stuff. And gas price goes up or gas price goes down or the pipeline blows up or doesn't blow up or Israel this or Israel that and all that. It doesn't mean you're in the tribulation. You want, you're still here. When the rapture happens, that's when the tribulation starts. That's where that false teaching comes in. Now, whatever the uh, amount of time that you think that's going to be remaining there, you don't have to worry. You're not going to be here. Amen. Amen. When's it going to be? <laughs> I keep hoping. You know, I know some of you feel you got it stewed down to a fine point and you think you know exactly when it's going to be. I wish you'd tell me. If I thought it was going to be tomorrow, I'd be out on 295 passing out tracks. You say, why, man? I mean, get, get it in while you can. I mean, <laughs> maybe my motive wouldn't be good, but think about that. Sure. I mean, the Apostle Paul's over there in, what, Acts 14 or so, and they wind up stoning him, and then he's dead, and they draw his body out there, and his soul leaves. He goes up there in 2 Corinthians 12, and he said, I knew a man in the body, out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. And then he says the thing again, because when he got up there, he's in a bodily shape, and he said, man, look at that. <laughs> And he can't see his finger. And he says, look at that. And Stephen says, hey, how you doing, preacher? Sure, it's good to see you, man. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. And he goes to wave at him. He didn't have a hand there, but he can see him. And he said, uh, whether in the body, out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. And then he comes back down. And you know what he does? You read Acts 14. You know what he does? He gets back in that body. He smells like a camel. He's been beat up, buddy, and, and, and killed. His body's dead. And he inhabits that body of broken bones and bruises and battered and cut up. You know what he does? He goes right back into the town. <laughs> you say, why? Do you know where he had just been? He's like, I'm going to make sure they punch my ticket and I get out of here for good. I mean, from that point forward, Paul becomes a suicidal maniac, man. He's not afraid to go anywhere. He's like, are you kidding me? If you saw what I saw and knew where we were going, you'd be wanting to get out of here too. Now, if you had that vision, that ability, and you could see that, it'd make you live a lot better life. You'd be a little bit more of a daredevil for Jesus. Amen. And we don't get that benefit. Paul doesn't even get to explain what all took place there. But the, Apol the Apostle Paul is trying to teach you, tell you, that soul separates from your body. And the Old Testament, the soul went down. Paradise, Abraham's bosom. The New Testament, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Paul says in that passage there, he said, I was caught up to the third heaven and paradise was there. So they don't rightly divide. You know what they say? He says to the thief on the cross, today thou shalt be with me where? In where? Well, Paul says it's up in the third heaven. If you don't rightly divide, you know what you got? You got a thief going up there and he's up there in heaven and Paul going up there to catch him. No, he went down to Abraham's bosom. Ephesians 4, is not he that ascended, descended first in the lower parts of the earth and led captivity captive and took him out three days later. See, if you don't rightly divide your Bible, you know what happens to you? You wind up a train wreck and then you get into soul sleep. And then you get into all the other kind of stuff that's connected with that. If the soul that sinneth, it should die. You don't understand the circumcision. You say, what circumcision? The circumcision of your flesh from your soul. It's cut away. <laughs> Paul said, it's, Paul says, the Lord told him, it's a circumcision made without hands. Reckon what sword to use, what scalpel. Does he use a tin blade? What scalpel does he use? I'll tell you what he uses. It's right there in Hebrews 4.12. The Word of God. Quick. 
powerful, sharper than any two ever sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder, the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit, joints and marrow, yes. discern or thoughts and tents of the heart, right? He uses the Bible to cut your soul away. That's why I'm, I'm giving you a message on eternal security right now. That's why that now that you mess up in your flesh, you, you can't mess up your soul. Yes, if you're saved, your soul is safe. Amen. You hear me? Yeah. Now, I didn't say the Lord wouldn't paddle your behind. And I didn't say you won't lose rewards of the judgment seat of Christ. And I didn't say that the things that you do in your flesh, that you wouldn't pay for it here. You might wind up going to prison or sit in the electric chair or get the needle or whatever it might be. I said your soul is safe. Right. Yeah. Amen. And if you don't make the right division, you know what will happen? You'll teach like some people not far from here. They teach you that if you're not living it, then you ain't. Well, then I ain't. You say, why? Because I don't live it all the time. I think I did pretty good. Then I get to reading. And the next thing I know, I'm reading Isaiah 14. I will ascend and I will be like the Most High. And I'll set my throne above this. And the Lord shows me my pride and stuff like that and says, are you living it, are you? Lord, I must not be. See, you, you think because somebody doesn't have a cigarette in their hand or a can of beer in their hand or they're not running around with men or women or whatever it may be or not listening to rock and roll music, you think, man, that's kid stuff. That's wading pool stuff. That's stuff you can fall in there and drown in six inches of water. That's kid stuff. That evil speaking and that gossip and that envy and covetousness and whew, boy, that's where the rubber meets the road. Amen. That pride and that, that self-security and that kind of a deal. Is this helping you? Yes, sir. You say, what are you telling me? I'm telling you, I can't mess it up. It's not mine to mess up. Amen. David says over there in uh, Psalm 51, he said, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Amen. When I'm saved, I'm putting a cocoon. <sighs> he sealed me like uh, the old preacher used to use, like a can. Of, any of y'all know about canon? Some of y'all do, I know. You know about canon? You know, they take that glass jar and they get the beans in there or the peas or whatever, butter beans or whatever it's going to be. The friend of mine named Chuck used to do up in, uh, up in uh, North Carolina, he put deer meat in there after he put it in a pressure cooker. Then he would stick it in there and then you put that lid on there and you boil that glass. And that glass boils and as it boils, the steam comes up out of there and then it, it sucks that lid down on there. And then you just put the lid. The lid doesn't hold it. That thing's sealed. That's why you take that lid off of that mason jar. Sometimes you got to get a can opener to break that seal. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the seal ain't broke on you until the day you die or the rapture happens. You can take that jar and you can set it up there in the basement and you can put it there and it can get dust on it and dirt on it and it can get messed up and all that. And then you rinse that thing off and pour out the beans and no matter how dirty the jar is, the beans still taste good. That's you. You're sealed. So, well, you're telling me that it's okay to sin. Uh, 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 uh. Careful now. <laughs> I didn't say that. I said it won't affect your soul. But it'll affect your inheritance. It'll affect you. Every decision you make, every decision you make, held in light of the judgment seat of Christ, the Lord will hold you accountable for it. And just do what I want to do. Help yourself. You can do it. It won't affect your salvation at all. Affect you the judgment seat. You're like a tree that's growing like this. And all of a sudden, the Lord said, if you'll just stay on that path, that straight path, that narrow path, if you just stay on that path right there, everything will work out okay. You'll come out of the right, like Jack and the Beanstalk, man. You'll come out of the right place. You'll be up there in the kingdom where you're supposed to be. Oh, well, Lord, I decided to go over here, okay? That's it. You know what happens to that branch? It goes over here. The only way back to the tree is to come back down that branch. You can't take that thing and bend it back over and connect it here. You know what you have to do? You've got to come back down that thing and get back down here where you went off the track. That's, good. Amen. That's where a lot of Christians stop. Yes, sir. They won't ever go back come on. and say, Lord, I drove off over here for a while and I was wondering if I'm be, I could catch a connector around here to get back over here, to get back on the thing my Bob, the Doomy Fletchy and this and that and the other. My GPS has gone out. But now the way I got it figured, if I can get here, all you're doing is keeping on going out here. And then before long, you know what the Lord says? Uh, you, you left me back there. Come back to where we got off track. Amen. But Lord, if I do that, you know what I got to say? I made a wrong turn. And you weren't the problem. Yes, sir, that's it. And the Lord said, yeah. What happened to the prodigal? 
if I remember the story correctly, and correct me if I'm wrong, I know I'm in the midst of Bible scholars here. Didn't he come back to the house before he got restarted? Can I use this as an analogy? Didn't he come put the plug back in the wall? You know what most of you prodigals won't do? You won't go put the plug back in the wall. You'll look for an alternative source of power. And you'll stay longer in the far country than you need to. Because you know what the Lord's going to do? He's going to be right, right back there. He ain't going nowhere. He's not gonna, you know what he's going to do? He's going to wait on you to come back. You can't find where the prodigal's father ever left. Well, that'll be the end of things here this morning. We'll, we'll have to stop there. I've, I've got about eight more of these I want to try to show you. And uh, I, I hope you understand. If nothing else, some of you looked a little bit shocked when I told you about the beans. Um, but, but you're like a bean in a, in a mason jar. You can't get dirty. Man, if nothing else, you ought to thank the Lord for that. Yeah. So, well, I don't plan on sinning. Well, God bless your heart. You must be going to die before noon. Amen. Ananias and Sapphira didn't sin anymore either. <laughs> but they died before noon. I don't know that that's the choice I want to make. You know what I do? I, I err on the side of I probably am going to. Thank God for the blood. Yeah. Father, bless your word and thank you for it. I pray you'll be with us in the upcoming service. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, a short break and then we'll come in for the morning service. Ladies, you can meet back in my office. Miss Carol's back. Meet back in my office and pray. Sir? No, sir, I'm just going to hang out.
right, good morning. Let's go ahead and stand and take your hymnals and turn to page 93. Page 93, we'll sing the song that they're playing there. Hark the Herald Angels Sing, page 93. to be able to hear these strings so will you all go through it just one time through the song and we'll just listen to the instruments will you play along with them for the pick up on the chorus or the, the second like the third and fourth verse there all right on the third now ready Now hail the heaven born Prince of Peace on the third now. Like, likeness now or face stamp thine image in its place you've got now if you just came in here this morning you wouldn't look around here and say these people um, me included look just like Jesus Christ have the image the second man stamped on us 
but you can't see what's on the inside. And on the inside, that new man looks just like Jesus Christ. And we're doing our best to have that, to have the outside look as much as we can as a, like, like what's on the inside. It's not quite there yet, but thank the Lord Jesus Christ who came down here to stamp the, the new man's image on us instead of the old man. So when the Lord Jesus Christ, when we stand before God, he won't see this old man. He won't see your sins. He won't see everything. All the, he won't see all the transgressions, all the failures that you had this week. Um, in this in this life, he'll see the image of Jesus Christ. And what a blessing! Amen. All right, we'll have. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, be seated here, and just uh, just take a moment to welcome you to Bible Believers Baptist Church. It's a blessing having everybody here with us. If you are visiting with us here today, it's good to have you. And please let us know if you need anything at all. Um, hopefully, as you were coming in, one of the ushers saw you and got you a visitor packet. It's that little red packet has some more information about who we are as a church, what we believe. And there's also a visitor card, if you don't mind dropping that in the offering plate as it comes by in just a moment. We'd like to be able to have a record of your visit. We appreciate you doing that for us. And uh, if you need anything at all, please let us know. And if you'd like to be able to meet um, uh, Brother Peacock, our pastor, um, Pastor Peacock, right after the service here today. He usually stays right around the front of the, uh, of the church here. And you can come up to him, say hello, uh, shake his hand, ask him any questions that you might have about the church here. And I uh, hope that you enjoy the service today. And that's, uh, I think Preacher has some announcements. Do you have announcements with you? Okay, let's have the men come on forward and take up our morning <laughs> offering. And then uh, Preacher's got announce announcements that, that we'll do during the offering. Brother Chase, once you get set up here, would you mind praying for the offering for us, please, sir? Just a couple of things real quick here, and then I'm going to have Brother Beasley make a quick announcement about one of the babies we've been praying about for a while. But um, remind you now, next week is the Christmas play, and so your practices have been going well. I've been hearing a lot of great things about that, and everybody is set up for that, and that's a big event for us. That'll be next Sunday night. And then I want to remind you that on Christmas Eve, the following Sunday, we'll have Sunday school and Sunday morning. And then after Sunday school and Sunday morning, we won't have a Sunday evening service. Don't get used to that, but give you Christmas Eve to be there with your family. And uh, I made a mistake about when uh, Miss Summer's going to have Miss Sharon and Miss Bonnie's class and uh, Rebecca's class. It'll be on uh, during Sunday school during next on the 24th. Is that right? On Christmas Eve. So we'll make sure that that's taking place. That's just for those two classes. Brother Beasley, if you would, please, if you'll give us a report, just if you don't mind, <laughs> nice and loud from where you are. I just want to publicly praise the Lord for what he's done and for Baby Hudson. Uh, I want to thank the church for praying for him and ask you to continue praying for him. Uh, for some of you that don't know, he lost his twin brother at 10 days. Uh, but he is really doing well. He's over three pounds now. He is... Uh, off of the oxygen, off the CPAP mask. He's on a nasal cannula, and uh, he's almost big enough to start wearing clothes. Oh, uh, hey. so, thank you. Hey. Hey. That's a blessing, ain't it? I don't, I don't want to use the world's terms and all that, like a little Christmas miracle. It's kind of neat. So I'm still a little bit nostalgic about some of those things, and I think you can keep those things in a proper kind of balance without getting too... Uh, whacked out about it, so um, you do with that whatever you want. If you're fear equal about it, that's fine with me. We love you anyway. Um, all right, I already mentioned to you the Christmas play, birthday for Jesus was wonderful, and the kitchen staff outdid themselves, Miss Tracy. We're getting all kind of accolades here. Uh, everything was wonderful. The classes and all helped get everything cleaned up. Everything uh, was done. There is some food left over. Is that for us? Oh, it's for anybody. It's free. Okay. I don't know why, but Brother Lance and Noreen come to mind. But you're, they're, they're already dumping out of your house now. You don't have what you used to have, but, you know, 
you're kind of getting like the empty nesters. It won't be long before it'll just be y'all. <laughs> <laughs> you do realize your kids are sitting all around you, Miss Noreen. Okay. She's like, yes, this is great. All right. All right, now, I forgot to mention this. Wednesday night, the 20th, so you got uh, the play, play will be next week, and then, I mean, next Sunday, and then the following Wednesday, we'll have our candlelight service and our uh, Lord's Supper for uh, Christmas time. That'll be next Wednesday, and uh, we'll have regular Q&A at 6 o'clock that day, and then we'll have our, um, our candlelight service that evening. So I hope you'll come and be a part of that. All right, Brother Sam, whatever you got, come on, bring it. Appreciate it. Thanks for filling in while I was going. Appreciate it. Amen. Amen. All right, we'll do one more here, one more congregation. We'll sing page 141. 141. sing for us now. They're singing a song that Miss Amy Honeyfield wrote herself. She wrote the words and the uh, and the tune to it. So it'll be new to, for, to us to hear, but if you can, if you can kind of uh, listen to the words it's, uh, written by her. It's a blessing that we have young people that are writing hymns. Um, not writing, you know, praise and worship music and all that stuff, but Bible believing young people that are writing hymns. Uh, we need it today, and it's a, it's a real blessing to be able to hear it. Amen.
Chapter 2, please. The 
time of the year that we refer to as the Christmas season. Let me make sure that you clearly understand I'm well aware of Jesus Christ was most likely born in September or October. I also am aware that there are certain things that other people pervert and misuse. And I'm not going to quit having the Lord's Supper because the Catholics misuse it or stop baptizing because of what the Church of Christ does. You have to have some sense and some balance to certain things. And when I refer to the Christmas season, I'm not referring to Santa Claus coming down a chimney and all the commercialization. But for me, it's a great time to reflect back on the fact that they just sang, Heaven came and touched earth below and came in the form of a little baby. And that, to me, is a, it's more than just the immaculate conception. It's more than just the virgin birth. It's an amazing thing that the God that created everything and always was would put himself in a human form and grow up just like you and me and be born in a stable. I, I, I have a hard time grabbing that in my mind to subject himself to not even being able to speak just to be in the form of a baby, of a baby. and getting hungry like you and I get hungry and thirsty and crying and needing his clothes changed and things like that. Uh, the fact that he would do that is an amazing thing to me and it says a lot about the man that died for you. So I hope that you'll give me the liberty to understand that there's some things that are actually in the Bible. Uh, and rather than wait until September or October to preach them, and I'll preach you a few messages on things maybe that we can learn in this case today from the wise men uh, that talk about the birth of Jesus Christ. But I'm not commercializing things. None of this stuff here, it's beautiful and I love it. That's not done to draw attention for commercialization or anything. Amen. That's done so that you remember that Jesus Christ was born. Yeah. And then he lived and died, yes. Yes. was buried and resurrected again yes. the third day. In Matthew chapter number two, we'll talk a little bit about what the Lord refers to as a wise man. I'm just going to give you a few verses. We'll let you be seated after Brother Larry prays. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men noticed from the east to Jerusalem. I mentioned that to you in Sunday school. They're going the opposite way of the world. The world goes from west to east. The sun goes from east to west. The sun rises in the east and sets in the west. Bad direction for you to go contrary of east to west. It is uh, in the Bible, you'll find on a regular basis that people are getting in trouble. When you leave the tabernacle, you're going out west to east. When you leave the garden over there, when Cain gets kicked out, it's west to east. When Adam and Eve are kicked out, it's west to east. When Jacob leaves, he goes west to east, and he has to come back from east to west to be able to get back to where God wants him to be at Bethel. There's a connection to that thing. Amen. The earth turns west to east. The sun turns east to west. Amen. Now, why is that important? Because the world is contrary to the Lord. You don't want to go the way of the world, west to east. You want to go east to west. Right. Notice what he says here. The Bible said, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and we're come to worship him. When Herod the king was... It wasn't Sunday night, obviously. When Herod the king was, had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him in Bethlehem of Judea, for it is written by the prophet... And thou of Bethlehem, a uh, land of Judah, art not at the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Brother Larry, pray for us, would you please? Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus and because of him this morning. Thank you, Lord, for what we've heard already this morning. Thank you for coming off a week and then being able to come to church with the doors being open here. Thank you that we know that we're going to hear the word of God preached. We thank you, Lord, that we can hear spiritual hymns and songs that lift you up already have been sung. Thank you for families in this church, Lord, that uh, you've directed in such a manner through the Word of God and, and not insisted on them, but helped them along the way uh, that their families might sing and glorify you in song. Thank you for that. Thank you for the good testimony for my brother, for the baby. And on and on we can thank you, Lord. Thank you for this place. Thank you for this meeting house. Thank you for this setting. Thank you for the old-fashioned ways 
Uh, Lord, the old landmarks be in honor. We thank you for that. Thank you for giving us a preacher that will stand by the Word of God and Amen. use him continually. And we don't take that lightly. We don't take it for granted. We just ask continually that you might continue to use him. Have your hand upon him this day, this hour. We'll give you all the glory for what's said and done. May you direct every word from his mouth. In Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. It can be seated. It's important for you to keep in the back of your mind now, even though when we do what's called a nativity scene or a, a scene of the birth of Christ, you'll often have the manger scene there with the baby Jesus in there. And then other times you'll have Mary and Joseph that join that. And then in the background you'll have the shepherds. In Luke chapter number 2, the Bible teaches that when they came to visit him that the Lord was a baby. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. The glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. For the angel, but the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you was born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and, good, uh, and goodwill toward men. Now here's what happened. Those shepherds heard that and said, let's go and see this. And when they came, they saw him as a baby. Here you'll see him referred to as a young child. There's a reason. The reason is, is when these wise men show up, the child is no longer in a barn. He's no longer in a stable. He's no longer in a manger. He is grown up there, probably around 18 months old, maybe up to two years of age, and he's in a house. That's where they come to see him. Now, you've got to keep that in the back of your mind because when you have the Orient, the, the three kings from Orient are, we usually put them and their camels and their gifts and stuff. That's just to show you the whole picture, not what actually occurred. Right. The baby was born. They saw his star in the east and they came from the east. And when they saw the star, they said, the king has been born. It looks like that star probably dissipates for a while, goes away for a little while, because it looks like it's nearly two years that it takes them to make the journey to find the kid. I want to say, first of all, in the first two verses of that thing there, you'll find out these men are wise because they had enough sins to follow the light God gave them. Amen. In other words, all they saw was a star and they said, you know what, we've been reading our Bible in the Old Testament. It says that uh, he'll have a star that'll mark his birth. And we saw that thing take place. And can I say this to him? The star didn't keep shining. They saw the star and they said, we need to go find him. And they started off. And can I say this? Secondly, they're wise because they walked by faith. You say, what do you mean they walked by faith? They saw a star and assumed what they'd been reading in the scriptures were right. And so they started out, even though they didn't see the star every single day. You say, what does that take? It takes a wise man, according to what the Bible says. I mean, think about this. Isn't that how you walk? I mean, doesn't God give you little glimmers, little glimpses of light every now and then? Isn't the first light that he ever gave you, wasn't that light to show you Jesus? He didn't show you all the things about the King James Bible and rightly dividing. He didn't show you all the other things, the wonders and the marvels in the book. He didn't show you all those things. The first light you ever had was just a light to light up Jesus. You just got a chance to see Jesus. It wouldn't be bad if we just remembered, you know what, we got that one right. I mean, I realize a lot of preaching is on how we ought to live and what we ought to do and our attitudes and all that other kind of stuff. But boy, just longing for the days of when I met Jesus, I thought, boy, this is as good as it can possibly ever get. I was blind to do everything else. You know, one of the strangest thing is, is when that light comes into your eyes, it tends to blind you about everything except Him. Amen. I long for the days to just see Jesus and not see all the hypocrites in the church and not see all the ne'er-do-wells and not see all the difficulties and the problems. They set out and they decided to go there. You say, why? The Bible said they were wise men. They followed the light of hell. Can I say this to you? God doesn't give the same light to everybody. You're not going to be a Dr. Ruckman if I could use that as an illustration unless God gives you supernatural light. Doesn't mean you shouldn't strive, but you can't duplicate someone else's light. The only thing you can do is follow the light that you have at that particular moment. And can I say this? It may be a glimmer. It may be the right direction. And you might start in that direction and that light goes out. You say, what do you do? Do you stop? No, you keep going on the last order that he gave you. 
and you continue to be faithful to keep doing that, how long was he going to go? When Abraham left in the Old Testament, he sought out a builder, I mean a city whose builder and maker was God. God didn't tell him where it was and didn't tell him how long it would take to get there. And he made a couple of baubles along the way and then he came back to the tree trunk and then started back out after he made a mess with his dad down there in Egypt. And Egypt happened to be going in the wrong direction because he went from west to east. And then when he came back, guess what he had to do? He had to come back from east to west. And then when he got back on the right track, the Lord got him along there. He'd wake up every day and say, maybe today, honey. And she said, well, where are we going? She said, I don't know. We're going to go for a builder, a city whose builder and maker is God. Well, I thought, you know, we were getting close. I don't know if we're close. It may be over the next hill. might be over the next mountain. might be a month away. might be th several days away. I don't know, honey. I just know he told me to keep walking until he tells me to stop. Amen. Do you ever pause to think about that? I mean, along the way, he hits Genesis chapter number 15. His name's Abram there. And the Lord says to him, I'm going to make a promise to you. Do you think God would have made that promise to that boy if he hadn't have followed the light that he had in the beginning? That's right. Do you think if he hadn't have started by faith to find that city whose builder and maker was God, that God would have stopped him along the way and say, Hey, I see you've been faithful to follow the light that you have. So I'm going to give you some more things. I'm going to make your seed and multiply you as the stars of the heaven and the sands of the sea. And you know what Abram says? Lord, how will I know? And he said, go build you an altar and make a sacrifice there. And 14 trips later, the Lord shows up there and makes a promise that is still in effect today. And that promise is going on right now. Somebody's trespassing on God's land right now. That's, that's not, that land doesn't belong to Palestinians. That's Roman anyway. That land doesn't belong. That land belongs to the nation of Israel. That's God's land. Well, preacher, I don't like that. That's not politically correct. I'm not talking about political correctness. I'm talking about the Bible. Ultimately, you're going to find that that's where it's all going to come out. Eventually, one day, everybody's going to come in line with what thus saith the Lord. But can I ask you this question, that supernatural revelation, that light that God gave to Abraham who winds up becoming the progenitor of at the time the Gentile and the nations of Israel, do you think that God would have given that to somebody who was not faithful in doing the least things first? Would it make any sense to you that he would have shown him uh, right at the very beginning everything he was going to do with him if he didn't wait to see whether or not if he could just do the least, the least things first? Sometimes we get so caught up in trying to do big things that we don't realize it's the little things that God watches. When you look at the building of the tabernacle, you look at the building, excuse me, of the temple, you have an artisopher that comes in there, Bezalel, and he is an artisopher and not just brass and wood and stone. He is across the board. He knows everything. And when the Lord lays out that plan, he lays out a thing on the top of the column, the top, not the top across where the crown would go, the top of the column called the lily work. And nobody except the one that built that would even know that it was there except God looking down on it from above. You would have to get above that place in order to be able to look down upon it. That was up there for God to check the faithfulness of the builder. Hey, will you do something that no one else can see because I'm watching it because I want you to do it. Would you be willing to do that and nobody even know that it's there? Nobody see a picture of it. Nobody see a painting of it. Nobody see a blueprint of it. I just want to know, will you be as particular and as careful about the unseen as you are about the seen? Right. And the Lord said, I want that in my temple, my tabernacle. I want it there. I want something that's just there for me to take a look at. You know, ladies and gentlemen, can I say this to you? That sometimes God will give you light and He asks you to do things that are in secret or in private. And the real test is when you realize that recognition and appreciation and pats on the backs and all the other kind of things like that. God's not looking for that. You know what He's looking for? Will you just be faithful to do what I've asked you to do? Amen. Along the way, you know what will happen? God may give you something supernatural. He doesn't give everybody else. I'm talking about He doesn't give you the same amount of light as anybody else gets. He doesn't give you the same kind of light that everybody else has. Be careful about taking somebody else's light. You say, why? You might find that light's hot and shows every crack in your armor. You might find that that light don't make you look good. 
You might find that the light that you think you want and have so bad, you just got to have it so bad that if you were in that light, you would crack and crumble like an egg under a giant's heel. Be careful what you covet when you're coveting. Well, how come he gets that? Why does she get that? And why this and why that? Be careful about coveting someone else's light. If that light were to shine on you, you might not like what it shows. Amen. So what do they do? They follow the like they had. He didn't give it. He looks like he gave it to three. I've read some commentators that say four. Whatever. Wise men is what I know. And they would have had an entourage that was there with them, but they're following after them. Can I just say this to you? He didn't give it to anybody but the wise men. You, where you get the three is, is the gold, frankincense, and the myrrh. And it's probably three because the Lord does things in threes. But that's beside the point. The bigger issue is He doesn't give it to anybody else. Be careful about taking somebody's light. God knows when He gives somebody light, whether or not they can handle the light. You know what I've learned? I've learned this, ladies and gentlemen. I've learned that if you're coveting someone else's light, it shows that you are disgruntled with the light God has given you. And in most cases, you haven't followed the light God gave you. You're blaming somebody else because they got the light and you don't. I've learned that God doesn't give everybody the same kind of light. I've learned that these wise men had to deal with the responsibility of being told something supernatural that He didn't tell everybody else. They were wise men. But they had a backbone like a saw log. They got ready to go, ladies and gentlemen, be like the Lord calling you and telling you to go to Syria right now and preach the gospel. To tell you to pack up and go to Saudi Arabia and go stand in the downtown square and preach the gospel knowing you're fixing to get your head cut off. That's what it would be like. Hey, we're going to go find this king. Really? What king? Oh, well, they said in the scripture. What scripture? The stuff that's been written out here in Isaiah and in Jeremiah and those kind of things. I mean, it's been written out there. As a matter of fact, there's a passage over there, an obscure passage, way back there in Numbers, that just said that his birth would be marked by a star. We just happen to believe that. What are you going to do? We're going to pack up what we have and we're going to go wherever he tells us to go. Where's that? Wherever the star's at. No GPS system. No map, just we're going based on the light that we have. That wasn't a lot of light. And nobody had traveled that path before. Nobody even knew who it was or where it was. As a matter of fact, can I say this to you? Herod was there and Herod did not have the information that they did. Herod had all the wisest people that were there. The Pharisees, the Sadducees in the New Testament, they would have been there. All of the people, the religious people, all of the wise men of that day would be looking for whoever this is. He has not given them any light whatsoever. And they are within 10 miles of where the Lord is born within 10 miles. They've taken nearly two years to be able to travel and God's given them light that He hadn't given somebody in the closest proximity. Are you with me so far? They got light that even Herod doesn't have and Herod has at his disposal everything that's possible. Can I remind you of this? God gave a boy named Daniel. He gave him certain light that he did not give everybody else. The wisest men of all that were there trying to interpret a dream. And guess what? He gave that wisdom to Daniel and only Daniel. You can't have an artificial light. The wise man follows the real light. Even though there may only be a little bit of it, he'd rather follow a pen light than a halogen if he knows the source. The wise men get ready to pack up and leave over there. And can I say this? They're wise because they decided to walk by faith. And can I say this to you, ladies and gentlemen? You don't have to do anything other than follow the light that God's given you. Once you get saved, all of a sudden God begins to judge you based upon you accepting the light that He gives you. The old preacher used to say, light rejected becomes lightning. If God opens things up to you and you see those things and you begin to realize those things, believing those things, that's what causes it to effectually work in you. And when you believe that, the light gets brighter and you get more information. But can I say this? If you allow that truth to drop to the earth, the light continues to grow dimmer, not brighter. You begin to lose direction in the times like that. 
And they began to set out there and it looks like all of a sudden after the shepherds came when he was born and now they've gone, it looks like they're getting ready to pack up here shortly and head to Egypt, although they don't know that yet. And the Magi come in and the first thing that they would do is they would stop by there and they would check in with the political figures of those days because after all, they weren't leaving a small footprint. Can I say this to you, even though you find out that Herod is wicked, they still were wise enough to realize if we're going to be in another man's country, in another man's city, and there's a king that's over that, you know what we might ought to do? We might ought to check with the authorities before we go any further to let them know that we're not here to create problems for them. You say, what is that? That's wisdom. I guess some of you don't like that. You feel like, you know, it's an infringement upon your rights. No, if you're in somebody's house, you might want to ask them before you light one up. Yeah. If you're in somebody's house, you might want to ask them before you put your stinking feet on their furniture. Yeah. If you're in somebody else's house, you might want to, before you bring your pop the top and your six pack in there and your idea of nachos and beer and having a party and all, you might want to ask the owner of the house whether or not it's okay with them. Yeah. Can I say that? It, it replies in religious matters also. Yeah. If you're going to go street preaching, you know what you better do? You better check with the authorities and make sure that we're there for street preaching. Can I just say this just for a second, ladies and gentlemen? Our job, even when it comes to street preaching, is not to carry some kind of a political agenda. Our idea is, is to preach the gospel. That goes across all boundaries and everything else. The gospel is for everyone. I don't care which side of the line you're drawn on. Republican, Democrat, Tea Party, in, out, up, down, all around, Biden, don't, Trump, this. I don't, it doesn't make a difference. We're there to preach the gospel, not to have a political affiliation or waving flags for whoever, what, no, no, uh-uh. My issue is I'm here to preach the gospel. You know what can happen? That agenda can get in the way of the gospel. Why are you here? I'm here to preach Jesus. Who's Jesus for? Whosoever will. You heard it saying today. For anybody that wants him. What do you accept the fact he's virgin born and he was lived and died and buried again, buried and rose again the third day? That's what he did. Well, it wasn't me. It was a Jew. Yep, he was a Jew. What did he do? Died for Gentiles too. Would you like to get in? Well, are you a Republican or a Democrat? You think the Lord's going to check your party, your affiliation when you get to heaven? Oh, well, I'm anti this and I. No, you're all about yourself. You're, that's what the truth is. You're all about yourself. You're using God's platform for your agenda because it, all it is is an attention getter. That's all it is. It's just to try to get a spotlight. You're taking somebody else's light and the light you're taking is not from a person. It is from Him. Amen. When you use a pulpit, and this is for every preacher that's listening, and you use it for a political agenda or anti-governmental rhetoric, I'm telling you, you're stealing the spotlight. Amen. You better follow the light that got you here in the first place. Bless God, He didn't give you a pulpit to preach an agenda. He gave you a pulpit to preach Jesus. Very idea. I got a pulpit, so now I got an opportunity. Well, just go stand up on the soapbox at the house and let her rip tater chip. But when you're standing in God's pulpit, you need to park your agendas at the house. All you're doing is trying to get attention on you. You're grabbing the spotlight. Amen. You think you're in the light. It's artificial. That's His light. You've taken it off of Him. They come to Him in the New Testament. They're getting ready to have a big meeting. You know what they say? Sir, we would see Jesus. Why do you think they asked that? Because they hadn't seen Him in a while. They got together for meetings and it was about everything except Jesus. There's no reason for us to have a building next door and to fill it up like you did during the other previous meeting. There's no point at all if it's not to preach Jesus. Amen. There is nothing else we can do to help people be any better and for anything else other than to preach Jesus. Amen. So a preacher, don't you believe in that? No, I don't. I think the thing to do when it comes to public ministry is to preach Jesus. Amen. Shouldn't we be involved in the affairs of today? No, you're stealing the spotlight. Amen. Amen. Follow the light you had. Do you remember? I'm get off this in just a second. But do you remember when you first got saved that it was enough just to preach Jesus? Amen. 
Do you remember that? Do you remember that you didn't have to have all the other stuff in there? That you just were so enamored with Jesus and so wanted to lift Him up and so excited about Jesus. Somebody could get up and sing, sound like styrofoam lids running together and you'd be like, whoa, man, that was really good. I mean, the Holy Ghost gave you some kind of supernatural ears and everybody else is like, man, what in the world is that? And you go, man, wasn't that good? And then all of a sudden that's changed. Just Jesus isn't enough anymore. And we got to have sermons on UFOs and space creatures. We have to have political agendas and who to vote for or not vote for. And whether to have a pipeline or not have a pipeline. Why don't you deal with that otherwise? But here, how about we just make it about Jesus? Amen. How about we just follow the light we have? It's done us pretty good, hasn't it? You're still shining, isn't it? They were wise because they followed the light they had. They were wise because they didn't get discouraged with the distance and the inconvenience from where they started to where they were going to finish. You say, why would you say that? <laughs> so many distractions nowadays. You say, why? Preacher, I've been on this road a long time now. What does that mean? That means God has allowed you to keep sucking His air and to keep breathing just so you can gripe back with the very lips He gave you to praise Him with and all you do is gripe and complain. Like He's been bad to you for letting you stay around and suck His air. That's free. If you had to pay for it, reckon how much you'd pay for a bottle of air to keep you around for another few minutes. It's inconvenient. It's difficult. I get tired of people telling me, Preacher, I'm ready to retire. Retire? I'm ready to retire. Um, you ready to retire? That's what you do when you've been working 30 years out in the world. You don't ever retire from being a Christian. When do you retire? Where do you get that? Can you show me that in the Bible? Jesus says, I'm going to retire now. I'm glad he didn't quit. I'm thinking to myself, where's his gold watch? I mean, he's been at it for over 6,000 years now. I mean, he should be getting a retirement party along the way, don't you think? But the truth is, is the fact is, is you don't appreciate that nobody's put a spotlight on you. And you've been doing it a long time. You deserve spotlight, don't you? Because you're special. Praise the Lord, it's Christmas message. Hallelujah. I'm the, Christmas, uh, the ghost of Christmas past. <laughs> what are you so disgruntled about? Well, what did you expect when you're running contrary to the world? Did you not expect things to be difficult and hard along the way? Didn't you say when you got saved, Lord, you, hey, not my will, but thine be done. Amen. And then all of a sudden we're, we're disgruntled and we're upset because along the way we hit a pothole. Along the way nobody brought us some fresh water or bread along the way. But we're still on the way. Can I say this to you? They didn't get disgruntled. I'm positive back in those days it was hot and dry and dusty. They didn't ride Cadillacs. They rode camels. Yeah. Not the kind you smoke. <laughs> I mean the kind that stink. One hump or two, that's all. You know, it's kind of like, I don't know, give me two. It'd be like a little more comfortable, I guess. And they rode animals and they slept outside. Didn't have air conditioning. Where are y'all going? We were waiting for that star to show back up, but last time we saw it, it was right over here in this particular place there. So we just started off there, and we're just kind of keeping our eyes in that direction right there, and we're going to keep on going. Well, how long have you been going? A long time. When are you going to get there? I don't know. Couldn't tell you. What are you going to do? Get up tomorrow and do the same thing we did today. Cook a little breakfast, get a little coffee, uh, get a little bit of the scriptures in there, look for that star, don't see it, where we go? We're going the same direction we went yesterday, boys, let's just keep going. You think we'll get there today? Sure, I hope so. Looking forward to it when I see him. Yeah, yeah, but I ain't seen the star yet in a while. No, I'm walking by faith. According to the light I have. Amen. Yeah, but I mean, you're running low on food and low and running low on money and running low on this and that and the other. Matter of fact, why don't you take that gold, silver, and precious stones and hire you a Learjet and get there quicker? No, that don't belong to us. Amen. We're just in trust with it. Amen. We're taking that to somebody. Yeah, but see, you hadn't been there yet. Why are you holding on to it? Because it don't belong to us. Amen. We're not an Aiken. Right. 
we taking that to somebody special. Yeah, but you haven't seen him. Now, but, but, but we're headed in that direction. How many days you been doing this? Long time. Can I say this? There wasn't a ticker tape parade. There wasn't a Pavarazzi. There wasn't anybody that even knew until they showed up in Herod's palace. Nobody even knew they were on the way. Goodbye to their family. Goodbye to their friends. Goodbye to everything. We're going over there. What? We're going to go look for him. Man, you talk about wise. Most people, you know what they'd say? They would be wise. They'd be looking at it and say, man, you're a fool to do something like that. I mean, where's the guarantee? There ain't none. Can I say this? He had enough sense to check in there with Herod and they listened to the story and they kind of boast a little bit and say, oh, you haven't read and you didn't know and this governor's going to be born here and so on and so forth and, and that kind of thing. And they get ready to go. And amazingly, after they've been faithful to do that, if you look in that passage, you know what you see? The Lord shows up. They're 10 miles from where his house is. It looks like until the first time they saw him, until now, they haven't seen him. The Bible said they rejoice. You say, why? There ain't nothing like a second dose. Yes. Amen. There ain't nothing like, man, ain't this a blessing? Can I ask you this? If they'd have been off 10 miles, you think the Lord would have showed up? If they'd have just decided to go where they wanted to go instead of where God wanted, do you think that, that, you, you think that, he, that the Lord would have showed up? Do you think that the Lord shows up when you're not on the right path? Is it possible that the reason you haven't seen Him in quite some time is you're not even on the path He puts you on to start with? Is that even possible? Merry Christmas! <laughs> I'm just saying, is it possible that you're the problem? You're on, your GPS is whacked out. You are broke. Amen! Amen. Amen. You started off, man, whatever you want, Lord, however you want it, Lord. I, Lord, I didn't think you'd do it like this, and I didn't think you'd do it like that. I, I, Lord, I'm going to keep my eyes on you, but Lord, I just really... You think that he was showed up. You say, what happened? They got done talking to Herod. The Lord said, hey, right here, angel of the Lord showed up. Amen. That's God. Uh, it's a hard one now, but you've got to think about this. That's God in the crib. Right. That's God in the sky. And that's God in heaven. Amen. He's an angel. He's up in heaven as the Father and He's down here on earth as a human being. Amen. All three at one time. Yep. See, how does He do that? I don't know, but I know when I got saved, I'm seated with Him in heavenly places. I know right now there's a boy up there eating a cinnamon roll. Y'all believe what you want. I know He's up there right now. There's a name tag. I got a seat right up there at the table. You say, where am I? I think he probably put me close to him, not because I'm in great fellowship, because he's afraid I'm run off somewhere. <laughs> I better keep you close by me, boy. Amen. And I know I'm still down here. Amen. But I know I have a desire to depart, which for me is far better. Amen. Don't you have a good down? Yeah, I do, I do, but compared to what's coming? Amen. There ain't no comparison. But can I just say this to you? They were wise because they followed the light they had until they got additional light. Amen. They just kept doing the same old monotonous thing. The routine duty. Thank God for a good bean counter. I would not want to do that every Monday. Help me, Lord. Data input. The different when we had 20 people. You start going over 300, that's a lot of... We need to buy you a new keyboard. But can I say this to you? There was nothing that indicates along the way that anything was other than routine. I thought y'all would be like, oh, like our life. Our life is like Chronicles. Every now and then you find a nugget. But the rest of it is like, Really? A Heshabub and a Hussabub and a Sikabak, a Bubak, a Yehi. I mean, you didn't believe in speaking in tongues. By the time you get through reading them names, you're thinking, well, maybe I am. I don't know what that is, right? I even have one of those Bibles that you can pronounce them with all the accent marks and all. It don't help. All it does is slow you down. And I want to like, can I just get through this? And then the old preacher said, well, you ever think one day that your name actually might be in there, but it's just a different name? And I'm like, oh, man, now I'm slowing down because I don't want to read over my name too fast, right? But can I say this to you? Because they followed the light they had and stayed on the right trail, the Lord showed them up and gave them additional light. The Bible said they were wise. So what happened? The angel of the Lord showed up and said, hey, I'm right over here. Can I say this? They rejoiced because they got confirmation 
they were on the right path. You say, how? The Lord tried their faith and they remained faithful and then the Lord showed up and this time instead of being a star, it's the angel. You don't have to read in there and go, well, we know angels are star in Revelation 1 or Revelation 11 and we know them and we don't. No, 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 you don't have to read. That. It's an angel. Hey, guys. Here's the house. Drop a pin on it. Right here. This is the house you're looking for. You don't need a numerical address or street name. Probably called straight, but at any rate. <laughs> in the city of Holy Hall. Anyway, you know what happens? They go up there. Look, if you will, please look in the, in the passage there. They follow that additional light in verse number 9. And in verse number 11, the Bible said their real motive came out. The Bible says, and when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, always the child before the mother, another message. And they fell down and they did what? You say, what's worse? The greatest form of worship is obedience. I wonder if they hadn't been doing what the Lord wanted them to do. I just wonder, just, just wondering. Would they have been as quick to fall down to worship Him? if they knew they weren't doing what they were supposed to do. This isn't a meeting with Saul on the road to Damascus. This is man, we found who we're looking for. And just like Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice, they got down there and they worshiped the Lord and said, Lord, you know what? It's not we're going to be obedient, we've been obedient. To follow the light we have. Can I tell you the gift that was given to them was the fact that they had their faith confirmed by sight? And everybody else, including their wagon train, are thinking, these guys are crazy. They call them wise. They're imbeciles. We've been traveling around here for over two years, and we hadn't seen nothing. And then, boom, there he is. But I want to say this, they're wise because when they came, they didn't come empty-handed. Look, in the passage, they brought something to him. You see that in verse number 11? The Bible said they brought him gold and frankincense and myrrh. Listen, don't, don't get hung up now on what I'm about to say to you. But I do believe it is a biblical principle that worship is connected with your willingness to give of yourself and of your substance. Yes. It shows that you've got some skin in the game. Yes. Right. And whether you ever learn that or not, that's entirely up to you. But it's interesting, they're called wise men. Because when they left the house... They had set aside some things for the Lord when they met Him. They intended to find Him, and if they didn't find Him, I don't know what would have happened to the gifts, but they never dipped into the till. That stuff was already set aside. I wonder if the Lord would call us wise men today. Don't we come follow the light we have? We get a couple of verses, and we come to church, and we're looking for the light, and the Lord said, well, here I am, and we worship Him, and then it's kind of like we expect... A great revival at bargain basement prices. I'm talking about your commitment. I'm not talking about your wallet. Your willingness. You, you, you want to see the Lord, but you kind of want to see Him on your time schedule. You kind of want to see Him in your place and your time frame and the way you want Him to be. And hey, Lord, I can't Sunday schools. I can't make that happen. You can make your business meeting. But, you, but, but it's, that's just too early on Sunday. You know what I'm saying? And so you come Sunday, it's kind of like, well, as long as He gets here by noon... But I, you know, can't really stretch out. And Sunday night, I know there's exceptions. But listen to me, Lord, you're, but, but see the bargain basement price Wednesday night? I didn't say you have to come at 6 o'clock. But you maybe come at 7. But I wonder if sometimes we're expecting the Lord to do something for us. And can you tell me this? Can you find out for me what they got in return? I can't preach this as a prosperity message where they gave all that and the Lord gave them, filled their coffers full. They threw it up with a spoon and it came down with a shovel. I can't, I can't, you know what the Bible says? They gave. Where did they get? You know what they got? They got to see the Savior. Yep. Amen. And you know what? Amen. It was enough. Amen. That's good. Think about it just a minute now. They got to see something other people didn't get to see. 
And they knew who it was when they were seeing him. They knew he was the king. Where is he that is born what? The what? They knew who it was. Other people saw the baby. They didn't know who it was. You know what it was? It was enough for them to get that. They didn't like, hey, Lord, I brought you this now. Right. You know, we walk like Egyptians around here. We give, but... How am I doing? Is it not enough just to see Jesus? Where's my return? Where's your return? Can I explore your motive for just a moment? It looks like the men are wise because they gave without expect expectation. Just seeing Jesus was enough. They're like, hey, we got to see Jesus and we got to give him. Can I just say this to you? God used the gold, silver, and precious stones. Bear with me for just a minute now. Mary had to offer supposedly a lamb for the purification after the birth. Remember that? Mary and Joseph were so poor. They couldn't afford a lamb. They had to offer a turtle dove and a pigeon. That's like on the bottom scale. They couldn't bring a lamb. They didn't realize they had the lamb in their hands. But at any rate, that's another story. Oh, that would preach right there. <laughs> you know, here's the lamb. Just let us... Anyway, right? How'd they get to Egypt? How they survive until Herod died. How they survive until after Herod's son came to reign. Somebody provided gold and silver and um, gold and frankincense and myrrh. You say, what was it? God financed the rest of that trip. They invested in Jesus' ministry two years after Jesus was born and took care of Mary and Joseph. And little baby Jesus. And can I say this? There is a benefit to his brothers and sisters. Because Joseph had to quit his job as a carpenter. He was on the lamb. <laughs> he was running. He was in Egypt. He couldn't work. He'd outed himself. How'd they survive? God provided from three wise men who just followed the light they had. They had no idea what God was going to do with what they had to give. They thought it was enough. We're getting to go find the king of the Jews. Can I say this? They were wise also. i got to say this. They were wise because when they left, that same angel appeared to him again and said, Herod is a liar. And you don't, it, mm -mm. don't go back the way you came. Mm. You already know where I'm going with this one. <laughs> they left different than when they came. Meeting with Jesus actually changed them. And it changed their direction. So how do you get all that? It's right in the passage. That's what it says, doesn't it? Yes. And they went it back a different way. You can preach that. You don't have to be a preacher of this kind of like, man, that's pretty good. You say what? Meeting Jesus should change your direction. It should fix you where you don't want to go back to the world. You don't want to go back to the clubs. You don't want to go back to all of the things. I don't have to list it. I'm going back a different way. Now watch and I'm done. Look at the response of Herod. He gets so mad because the wise men didn't come back and tell him the collateral damage is great. He kills every baby, not just there in Bethlehem, in the whole area. You see that in the passage? Yes. Yes. That's a lot of babies. Yes. Two years of age and under. The cost of following Jesus sometimes is expensive. Imagine how Jesus would have felt like that as he grew up. You know, they were trying to kill you. And as a result, a lot of babies died. Knowing some mama bears that I know, I bet laying right next to that baby was a mama. And in many cases, a daddy. 
I mean, it wasn't just babies. Some of you, if somebody were to take your baby, don't you tell me that you wouldn't stand in there and fight until they killed you first. I guarantee you, you would. Boy, the bloodshed. How horrible that must have been. You say, well, what happens? Well, if you're doing what God tells you to do, don't expect the rest of the world to embrace you. If you're going to be a wise man, you have to also expect that not everybody's going to embrace and be able to see what you see because they don't have the light that you have. Amen. Three wise men had more light than the king. Three wise men had more light than Herod or Herod's son. Three wise men had more ability to understand that light than all the most intellectual people in the palace. But can I say this to him? The world rejected him then. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the world rejects him now. Yeah. And because you are wise and you follow after Him, there it is. they're going to reject you too. Yeah. What does that mean? i got to stay on the path and follow the light that I have. Pray that He gives me additional light. Until He does, I'm glad to have a flashlight. Amen. 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 Appreciate it. Glad to have a lantern. That's right. My daddy used to describe it like this. He says, you ever been out in the woods? He said, back in the days, they'd go out to the, they had the outhouses back then. You have to go down the pathway. Some of you don't have to tell your age, but you know how far that goes, right? Amen. And he'd say, you go out there, and he said, you had, all you have was a lantern. You can't take a candle, it blows out. You have a lantern out there. This is before Coleman lanterns, and he said, you'd hold the lantern like this, and it would light the step you were at. And he said, every time you moved, it would light your next step. Yeah. Come on. Come on. If you raised it up like this, it blinds you. You had to always keep it down here. The only thing that you could see in the light was when you stepped out, you couldn't even see your face. Somebody looks and all they see, they just see a light moving. You just see a light moving. Didn't run with the light. You walked with the light as he is in the light. And you have fellowship, the one. Amen. What are you doing? Just following the light. Following the light. Where are you headed? I don't know. Right there. What happened? I'm, I'm going another three feet. Well, what about? Yeah, but where are you? I, I can't see out there. Why don't you lift it up a little higher? Yeah, see, the problem with that is I lose my... You've got to keep it down. Just three wise men. But boy, some things that we can learn from those wise men. I'm going to say this, and I'm... I, the hour I was done. I'm going to say this, and I'll close. Can you find me their names? You know why they're not in there? That's the author's intention to leave them out of the passage. So you can decide whether or not you want to put your name in there as a wise man. But they're wise enough, sir, to know better than to associate their name with being wise. Do you like your name put in there? No, sir. No, I can put your name in there as a wise man. Mm -mm. No, sir. <laughs> That'll go to my head. <laughs> Aren't you the three that found Jesus? Yes, sir. I mean, don't you want people to know? No, sir. You say, why? Might bring me fame, might bring me fortune, might bring me recognition, and might train wreck me. Yep. Amen. Isn't it interesting that the author leaves their names out? Sure. Because part of being wise is knowing that being wise doesn't mean that you're always recognized as wise. Amen. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Three wise men. Father, we thank you for your many blessings. Thank you for the things you teach us through these wise men. What it must have been like when they saw him as a young child, watched you preserve him. Don't know when they died. 
Don't know how that was. But what it must have been on their deathbed from that point forward to continually talk about the trip they made to find Jesus. Thank you for putting it in the Bible and for showing us some simplistic things that are here that can help us to be wise men and wise women and wise young people and wise kids. Help us, Lord, to recognize that we just need to follow the light we have, and that's all we're asked to do until you give us additional light. Pray you bless the message, Lord. Thank you for these people coming. Thank you for the time away, but thank you so much for a home to come home to. Please bless us as we go our separate ways this afternoon. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. No invitation today. God bless you. See you tonight. Uh, 445, 345 for play practice.